and then I open this academic session in which Juan Ochoteco Asensio will defend his thesis called Integration of Multiomics Data with Artificial Intelligence. Before we start uh, the defense, I would like also to welcome, of course, the audience, but also the, promote, the supervising team consisting of Professor Kleinjans, Emeritus Professor of Environmental Health Sciences, and uh, Dr. Caimon, uh, and he's a senior researcher at the Department of Toxicogenomics. Uh, I introduce them because otherwise you don't know their names. Maybe you do. Uh, but anyway, uh, my name is Nanda de Vries. I'm, I have the honor of, uh, of chairing the session. We, before we go to the um, actual defense, I would ask you to give a summary of your work. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, family, friends, dear Prorector, Corona members. Today I will do a summary of my thesis work, which is titled Integration of Multiomics Data with Artificial Intelligence, Studying the Toxic Effects on the Post-Transcriptional Regulation. So let us start with some fundamentals on molecular biology. Genes come from a very long molecule called DNA, which is copied and inherited across generations. When a gene is read, the DNA sequence is copied into a very similar molecule called RNA. This RNA is then fed through a structure called ribosome, in which it will translate the nucleotides that are part of the RNA into the amino acids that are part of the protein. Proteins are crucial for the cell, as they are the tools to do all the jobs. If you need a job done, you need to make a protein. Now, so far, this pipeline looks pretty simple. There are actually more characters at play. So let's go to it. As I said, RNAs can go to proteins, and those RNAs are called messenger RNAs. But there are also other types of RNAs. One of them is microRNAs. MicroRNAs do not code for proteins and are called microRNAs due to their small size. So instead of coding for proteins, they actually do the opposite. They are able to bind to messenger RNAs and therefore, the messenger RNA is not free and cannot produce proteins. Thankfully, there are other RNAs that can help at that. One of them is called circular RNA. Circular RNAs are called like that because their extremities are joined together. And therefore, they get a loop structure. Even though they have been recently discovered, one of the suggested functions is that they are able to bind to microRNAs. Therefore, if the microRNA binds to the circular RNA, the microRNA cannot bind the messenger RNA. And therefore, the messenger RNA is free again to code for proteins. For this reason, I wanted to investigate the importance of circular RNAs. I hypothesized that if circular RNAs and their abundance changed, it would probably have effects at the cell itself. And what is one of the conditions or situations where there are changes in a cell? Drugs. So for example, if we go to the example of chemotherapy, if we have a tumor drug, we know that the chemotherapy will be able to kill the cell. But unfortunately, there are also some side effects. And the ones that I focused on were the ones where they were able to have toxic effects on the heart. So in this chapter, chapter two, I wanted to focus on the effect of circular RNAs, how were they involved in the toxicity of hearts because of drugs. Now, obviously, in a cardiac cell, there are already circular RNAs. But what I wanted to study was whether when we have the influence of drugs would actually affect the number or abundance of these circular RNAs. Even further, I also investigated whether the microRNAs that can bind to these circular are also affected. And therefore, I also wanted to investigate whether the microRNAs are able to target some messenger RNAs. So I also evaluated the abundance of these ones. And finally, whether the proteins that are coded by these messenger uh, RNAs, whether they are also affected in abundance or not. So after investigating that, I focused on two circular RNAs on my results. 
for Sir Fidel, what I found was that when cardiac cells were influenced or exposed to chemotherapy, the expression of Sir Fidel decreased. While for Sir Ginas, what I observed was that the expression or exposure to antiarrhythmic medication led to the increase of the expression of Sir Ginas. Now, again, as I said, messenger RNAs can code for proteins. But unfortunately, it's not just as simple. The proportion between messenger RNAs and proteins is not linear. Or you could also say that the correlation between both of them is not exactly perfect. So how can we address that? Obviously, we know that there are other characters at play that might have a role in that difference between messenger RNA and proteins. For example, we have microRNAs, as we already mentioned, circular RNAs, and also other long, long coding RNAs. So my hypothesis was that if we took this into account, we should be able to investigate or have an approximation of how many messenger RNAs are actually able to code for protein, and thereof, and thereof have a better approximation of how many proteins are made. So how did I do, did do that in a specific manner? I did it with a formula on which I wanted to evaluate how many messenger RNAs were actually free on a final stage to code for proteins. And for that, I needed the initial abundance of this transcript, to which I had to subtract the number of microRNAs that are potentially able to bind to this transcript. But obviously, not all microRNAs bind to this one, because there are other messenger RNAs that can also bind to it, or there are other molecules, as I mentioned, circular RNAs or even long non-coding RNAs. So I also had to take into account the probability that these microRNAs are able to this specific transcript. So after I applied the formula, I had to check whether it worked. And there were some cases where it actually worked. And this was the case for the protein MYH9. So what I saw was that when I checked the, the abundance of the protein, when exposed to 5-FU, a chemotherapy drug, there was an increase on the abundance of this protein. Now, conversely, when I checked the original expression of the transcript that code for this protein, I did not see any difference between normal and drug conditions. Meanwhile, for the, when I used the formula, what I saw was that on normal conditions, the original number of transcripts that are able to transcript are actually inhibited. They are less. And only after an exposure to the drug, does this actually increase, which reflected what we also saw at the proteomics level. Now, this is all fine and good, but I wanted to actually expand the results to as many proteins as possible. This is not only because I wanted to understand the molecular biology behind it, but also to be able to use the information of both proteomics and transcriptomics to the maximum possible in order to complement each other. So as I already mentioned, we have different RNAs that we have. We have messenger RNA, microRNA, and circular RNA. And then we have a goal, an endpoint, which are proteins. Now, obviously, there are a lot of genes, there are a lot of proteins, and to handle and integrate all this data is pretty a lot of work for a person. So that, this is the reason why I decided to use machine learning, on which I used as input the transcripts that I had, and I expected the model by using this data to predict the amount of proteins, the proteins that there are in a cell. So among all algorithms that I evaluated, random forest was the one that produced the best results, that performed the best. So to test this algorithm, first, I trained it and tested it on hepatic data which get me, got me a result of R squared 0.7. What does that mean? It means that around 70% of the variability on the values of the proteins were actually predicted by the model. Now, obviously, you still have to check whether this is a fluke or does it actually also work for other situations. So what I did was pre create another model with the same characteristics, but this case on hard data 
or cardiac data. In this case, I got an R squared of 0.75 or 75% of the variability was captured by the model. Therefore, I was able to validate the results that I was getting from the other organ. Now, for my final chapter, let us start with an analogy. Imagine that we have to compare the height of two different groups. On the left side, we have the Spanish group, and on the right side, we have the Dutch group. As you can see, the Dutch group is actually taller than the Spanish group. But if we have to compare that using the average of the height, it's actually the same. Why is that? Because the average is actually heavily influenced by very strong or big values, such as is the case for the third Spanish individual. Similarly, this can happen at the molecular level. So, for example, if we quantify how many transcripts there are in a cell in normal conditions compared to drug conditions, as we see in this circumstance, there are actually an increase in the abundance when there's drug conditions. But because of one of the samples having an strange value, the statistical packages that are used normally, they will use that on average, and therefore won't be able to pick up this difference. So to fix this, this issue, I built another model, machine learning model, but in this case, it did not predict numbers, but actually classes or categories, which we named AutoRel. So the first class was called Relevant, which classified genes for which they showed a relevant biological difference across the expression of the groups. Then I had the irrelevant class, which encompassed genes that showed not or an irrelevant difference across the expression of the genes in different circumstances. And then we had a third group, which was dubious, which included those genes that were not encapsulated in neither of the previous classes. To test this algorithm, what I did was use data in which there was liver which was exposed to paracetamol. Therefore, normally when you use the analysis of this data, you can also, also find which groups of genes are affected in these circumstances. So I did that first with the standard package analysis. And what it showed were some interesting results. It showed that genes related to spermatogenesis, oocyte development, and even regulation of neuron differentiator were affected and in a significant manner. Instead, when I used the algorithm AltORL, there were some important changes. First, spermatogenesis, oocyte development, and neuron differentiation groups were removed. Not only that, but anion binding still remained. And even further, the coagulation group still uh, was appeared as a new group, which interestingly enough, was actually found in a previous paper as one of the effects of paracetamol on the liver. So to conclude, changes in the levels of circidyl and circ genus have been found as a result of cardiotoxic events. Second, formulating the post-transcriptional regulation allowed the improvement of a subset of gene expression levels as a proxy for protein expression levels. Third, I produced a machine learning model able to predict most of the variability found in proteomics based on transcriptomics data and other biological features. And fourth and last, I constructed AutoRel an artificial intelligence model that allows for the automatization of expert filtering of differential gene expression results. Thank you. Well, let me thank you for this summary. And then we'll now proceed to the actual defense of your <coughs> thesis. And the first question will be asked by the chair of the assessment committee that previously uh, evaluated the thesis. Mm -hmm. And that's Professor Smates. He's a professor in clinical genomics with a focus on mitochondrial disorders at our own university, Professor Smates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear Mr. Candidate, <clears throat> it was a pleasure to read the manuscript of your thesis, and I was impressed by the originality and novelty by your approaches my compliments, and also for your promotion team. But being a biologist, I was a bit curious to see how a bioinformatician looks at an organism. That was a bit disappointing. 
The second sentence of your introduction qualifies bodily changes being in a sense cell changes. Is that true? Is a body just a bag of cells? Are there no emergent properties anymore? So my first more conceptual question would be how would you as a bioinformatician describe a body? And how do you think in the end it can be explained by analyzing huge amount of data? An answer could be the famous answer Manuel, the, the servant of Faulty Towers, always gives. I know nothing, I'm from Barcelona, but I hope you have a better answer. <laughs> Dear highly opponent, a uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments. Uh, that is uh, an actual interesting question. What is a body? Is it just a bag of cells? Um, in a way, it is, but not only. Uh, first of all, because obviously these cells do not exist just independently. They actually interact with each other. There are the hormones, the different, right? And so, yeah, how do we and then interpret a whole body just with data? First of all, we have a lot of different data. So you can have population data, which gives you an average or an... We have a lot of different bodies as well, yeah. Exactly, no, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so <coughs> the point is, in a way, you have population genomics, for example, right, where you can actually have more or less be able to group individuals. But in the end, I would say the idea or the goal that people uh, mention that it's already here every five years, which is the thing about personalized medicine, which is necessary for sure to have data. So um, for me as a bioinformatician, it's crucial to have data in order to understand first the difference across individuals and also the difference even in the cells themselves. So, for example, even in a classic example like for cancer, you need to be able to differentiate between the different cancer subtypes in order mm -hmm. to be able to treat them. And if you say, yeah, you need the data, what, what I always miss is the, the evolution in, in this respect. So basically your DNA you described mm -hmm. is a software package which was constructed millions of years ago. And we had in millions of years patches which were related to all kinds of different environments. Mm -hmm. So all the pathways you're looking, they have a quite a different history than just being comparison between populations. They, they are connected to other species. So. How, uh, how can you include these type of things in your approaches? You mean as in taking into account the evolutionary changes? Of yes, these pathways, changes or? in the body. They are related to environmental situations which were long ago when we were swimming in the water or we were mm. had other types of climates. So right. the body is not a logical. It, it, I, I always compare it to a software package with patches over millions of years, right. <laughs> which you now have to reconstruct. And usually people say, well, we need to design it up front because we cannot entangle it anymore. Yeah, one of the f things that I also consider quite difficult is that people say that in the end we will get a model that somehow will be able to model everything. <laughs> and just with my own data, which was not so exhaustive, and still there were so many things that I couldn't know, even having the data itself. So for me, it still sounds a bit like science fiction, being still <laughs> be able to model a whole body just with data. For, first, because there are some molecules with, that we still don't know. Circular RNAs were found not so long ago. We knew that they existed for bacteria, but not mm -hmm. what was the actual function. There are still some scientists that say that they are actually still just an error in, in mm -hmm. yeah, during transcription. Sure. So the the question is, to, uh, uh, to which point, what is the question, I guess, in the end? And do we have enough data for it? Yeah. So do we have enough data to actually be able to diagnose a whole body, to be able to model everything? I would say not so far. Yeah. yeah, I think it will not be having enough data. I think you also need other things to do that. But let us bring us back to your models, yes. so your experimental models. Mm -hmm. And I must say, your models, and it might be that you inherited a data set, the models are a bit poorly described. Okay. So in your abstract, you said, for example, that you have the expression profiles of the circular RNAs, but you don't describe the model itself. In material, in material metal, methods, you describe the 3D microtissues, yeah. which were from in sphero dot. Right. There were cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts in a 4 to 1 ratio, which to me, what, what do you mean by that? So there were not really uh, much explanations on the model. And as we say, rubbish in, rubbish out. Right. <laughs> How good is the date, uh, the model that you were exploring? Mm. And can you comment on that? By model, you mean <coughs> the cellular model or the actual algorithmic model? No, no, the cellular model, the, the biological model. model yeah. 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 So because that is your input of your, all your analysis, yeah. Indeed. So the, 
input itself was not actually an organoid, as we would more normally understand it, but more as, as a 3D micro tissue. And from what I understand, four to one ratio means the amount of cardiac cells compared to fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. So for every four cardiac cells but that you have... why is it, you know? Hmm? Why? Why? Unfortunately, I was not <laughs> able to take that no. decision because that was already taken for okay. me. So I, I, suppose, I would expect that it has to do with the actual proportions that you yeah. find on the heart. And do you have different models? Are they biologically different? Are they from different individuals, the micro tissues? Or the, is it from a single one? The because, replicates, you mean? Yeah. Is it biological replicates or technical replicates? It's uh, so unfortunately, they are not. They are technical replicates. So they were for the same compound. They were uh, obtained the same day. It just they were yeah from the same mm -hmm. original batch. You split it in three different, right? So and it's one biological sample. Yes, indeed. Which so you draw very extensive conclusions on one sample, isn't it? On uh, in a sample, original sample, yes. Yeah. Even though, yeah. Wouldn't you have liked to have more biological variation? And as you said already commented in the beginning and showing your slides, you have huge variations right. among. In, uh, but for example, if we talk about the chapter two, we were yeah. also able to replicate that, as you can also find in the chapter when we did that. You used so I that see. experiment, as per se, that is actually a biological replicate. But that was also one sample, <laughs> again. <laughs> so that was one card, and you mm. call it a very robust, uh, uh, how you say it, the robustness of your approach that you have uh, mm. already uh, did it in one other sample. But for me, that's not very robust no, if indeed. it's one sample. In terms of number as an N, it's not very robust. What, I what was surprising for our team and me also is that starting from IPSCs, that you still got the same results when exposing to the mm -hmm. same things, even though the original tissue of both cases were, were nothing to do mm -hmm. like. So that's pretty, at least, impressive. That's not robust in a statistical point no. of view, how many samples you have, but... No, I agree. And, and, and the same pops up a bit in, in the proteomics. Yes? So, so you, you also do not really describe how the proteome has been isolated because also the way you isolate your proteins defines the, the population you get. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering why use proteomics? I know you're a data fan, but, but yeah. if you have a specific pathway with a number of proteins, there's so many approaches you can use to specifically challenge those pathways to look at Western bloods, enzyme assays or whatever, which could have give you much more confidence on, on the, 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 the conclusions you draw with respect to the proteins. Mm -hmm. So proteomics is just yet taking another big approach again. You mean that... You, why, why not go in depth for validating things that... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. You mean that proteomics, per se, you can analyze it for, with the, in very different ways? Yeah, you can isolate the proteome in different ways when you want yeah, to have yeah. more hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Uh, there's different ways you can isolate the proteins, which define eventually the population you will be interrogating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. But if you have a specific pathway, I would rather go for that pathway and just right. see how you can do it. That mm -hmm. is, uh, because that would support it, maybe your right. data much more extensively. That's actually true. Even though I would say in my case, what I was focusing more is whether more than the, let's say, the biology, okay, for example, for MYH9, we see an increase, yeah. but do we actually try to prove that e this increase exists, or, do, or are we actually more focused on whether we are able to somehow model that change at the transcriptomic level? Yeah. Let's say that that only occurs in that case, that could be the case, yeah. but we still are more focused on whether we are able to replicate, even if that's only a one-case scenario, more than what's actually happening in that yeah. specific circumstance. Okay. Thank you for your answer. I hope that brought a bit more biology in your yeah. career and I give I it back it. to work to the pro rector. Everything is biology, isn't it? <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'll turn to another member of the assessment committee who is also the secretary of this uh, committee today, and that's Professor Peters. He's a professor in mathematics in knowledge engineering in the Faculty of Science and Engineering of our university. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, first of all, my compliments with uh, a nicely written thesis. I enjoyed reading it, and also, by extension, my compliments to the supervisory team. Um, I would like to start off by, by questioning you about Proposition 4. So maybe one of the paronyms would be so kind to read that to the audience. <coughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, training, machi training machine learning algorithms to identify genes of interest based on expert selected data allows the automatization of the process, which is cited in this thesis. Yeah, 
Thank you. So, so if I understand correctly, this refers to Chapter 5, uh, the yes. Antoral system. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what you basically say in the proposition is something uh, I can hardly disagree with because it says you can automate this process using machine learning. Mm -hmm. And automation, in a way, you could, yeah, uh, to do this, uh, th that's not so hard. Uh, but it's, of course, what matters is what, what results from the automation. Right. And uh, let's compare that to, to weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to predict the weather. You just make a random guess and you predict it. But how accurate is it going to be? Um, and comparing to, to chapter five, I think there's a second parallel because in some days it's going to be easy to predict the weather for the next day mm -hmm. because it's a stable period, it's summer, it's good weather, and right. you predict the next, uh, next day to be similar. In fact, in smart buildings, this is exactly what they do in smart buildings. They, they set the temperature for the next day to fit today's temperature. Hmm. And in most of the days, that's going to be fine. Now, in chapter five, where you develop this machine learning method, uh, you decided to use three classes. Um, the relevant, uh, biologically relevant genes, uh, the irrelevant ones, and there's the dubious class. So the way I look at it is that maybe you're massaging the problem away by creating this dubious class where all the hard cases go. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, when, you, when you read the last sentence of, um, yeah, that's on page 144, the, the, just before the results start, the last sentence of, of section two, uh, you, you say, well, ultimately I'm gonna compare the relevant class. Well, I think the hard cases are in the dubious class. So hmm. could you comment on that and why you made these choices and what you intend to gain from it and whether this is a fair approach? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thanks for your comments and for your compliments. Indeed, uh, the dubious class exists for a reason. So, and that actually originated also when you had to actually make these classes. There are some cases that were so difficult in that sense of like, there were arguments both pro and against in order to understand them. Even when, when asking to several biologists, you could get different answers. So that was indeed the reason for that in the dubious. Is that massaging the problem away? In a way, yes. But also it's a necessary step at some point if you want to at least have a list that are results that are sure, as in relevant and relevant. And then for cases for which you don't have actual enough data to decide one way or another, because that I would actually say that you actually need an actual validation data. So for example, the problem is that these things could not actually be validated with proteomics data because proteomics data is not very sensitive. So most of the genes didn't have a protein value to evaluate. So that's why, in a way, why I generated that class, because these genes still existed. Do, do they actually have an effect on the cell? Are they actually differential expressed? You can, have, you can give a p-value to that. But the whole reason why I did the model was because p-values do not always per se reflect most of what an, a, a biologist can see in those values. So indeed, that dubious case in, in, in a way was like an optional category in which for people that only want groups or genes that are for sure categorized, they can choose for the relevant class. And if they want to add an extra level of, of genes that might actually be affected, that's where the dubious class works. Yeah, and then you would combine the two classes together. Indeed. And yeah. that would be your choice also to go for that one. Because uh, the related question maybe to, to, uh, to this is, uh, in the introduction there, you, you state that you're concerned with the existing methods that uh, they, create, they actually have too many false positives. Hmm. So Correct. They, they are not strict enough, and they give you a way too large a set of right. potential genes. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't you be more concerned about the false negatives? Because then you're going to miss out on interesting biology. Yeah, that's, I guess, in a way, the eternal discussion in a lot of places. Because... It also depends on your research question. What are you more uh, worried about? If it's like, if you want to evaluate the toxicity of a drug, I would be actually more uh, worried about false negatives because you're missing things. So you better add things to the mixture and you better, better be so, uh, but you better be, uh, yeah, just be sure that there's mm -hmm. nothing toxic to it. While for some other cases, that might actually not be so important. You actually just want to be sure whether an event is happening. And therefore, you don't want 
false positives in that okay. sense. So I, it, I guess yeah. I, the thing is that it's interesting because I also had that question. Mm -hmm. Where do I put the limit? If I move the threshold, I will increase one on the cost of the other. So it, I, and I realized that in the end, it depends on what you're actually looking for and what's more important. Yeah, but how to get to the false negatives, that is, of course, that, uh, yes, yeah, for something that would work differently, I guess. I would say then my, um, my solution would be if you only want, if you want to reduce the amount of false positives, then you only take the relevant class. If you want to reduce the false negatives, then you also include the dubious. Okay. Um, let me proceed with a different uh, uh, issue. Yeah. The, the, uh, the use of AI nowadays. What, what I saw in your models, you use a lot of features, yeah. uh, which is, of course, a classical approach to, to using AI. Mm -hmm. It's still done a lot. Yeah. Uh, but the modern trend is uh, not to come up with the features yourself and to have the machine develop its own features. Yeah? The features that we may find hard to interpret, mm -hmm. but which perform magically very well. Hmm. Uh, so techniques like autoencoders uh, are currently in use. Hmm. Have you looked into this area? Are you somewhat familiar? I have that? not. What I did instead was um, generate as many variables I could think of and then let the model decide through the training what is actually useful. And that is a very important thing because I got to the point, and this is the problem I guess with most of integration of multiomics, that you have one protein for which you have several transcripts even more uh, micronates for each transcript. So at the end, you have to decide to summarize data. Yeah. But then I said, okay, what do I take? The maximum expressed transcript or the average or the median? And that was also an important question. Yeah, but that's uh, why machines generating their own features could also help you out. Indeed, I guess. no, indeed. Yeah, because then you don't have to make that choice yourself and, and, and be a bit at a loss what, what is the, the right choice. Exactly. Uh, maybe a last question, if I mm -hmm. can. Um, Nowadays, also in, in machine learning, there is there's a trend to make uh, machine learning models as explainable as possible. So Indeed. explainable AI. Could you comment on that, how that relates to your tool? Indeed, that's one of the issues, uh, especially because a lot of people just call machine learning a black box, unfortunately, mm -hmm. which in a, in, a, in a way is true, even for random forests. It starts with decision trees, which are very nice to interpret. But then once you start to mix everything together and then you get the average of that, then where does actually these decisions come from? So indeed, that's a, it's an issue that uh, I try to at least help to vislumbrate a bit by using the ranking of features, right, the importance, but that is not actually telling you what the model is doing. It's just telling you, in a way, an average of what is actually the type of data that is using the most. That's unfortunately yeah. still the case. But I see, also, I have also seen in recent, that's also a hobby of mine, of check what new ideas people come up with machine learning. And I see that there's a, a specific um, effort to try to go that direction. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. So uh, thanks Which, very much yeah. for your answers. Then uh, thank I return you. the word to the Prorector. Yeah, and thank you for the questions, of course. I now turn to Professor Theo de Kock. He's a professor of popula population-based toxicogenomics at our university. Thank you. Um, congratulations, uh, dear candidate, also for your promotion team. And I particularly want to compliment you on just having the courage uh, to take up such a complex task in sort of filling in this gap between um, the transcriptome and the proteome uh, by looking at post transcriptal regulation. And uh, at the same time, as you indicate in your introduction, to develop analysis methods that can be useful for risk assessment. Uh, so that is a real challenge. And it makes sense in view of the complexity of the data to look at artificial intelligence approaches to understand what should not be understood. Uh, I also value the introduction, which introduces all the elements in this integration and particularly machine learning methods uh, help me uh, to get everything lined up again. So I would like to go to chapter number four, and I have some, uh, some questions on the data set used for, and the feature selection on page 117. And uh, what intrigued me was that you, uh, for the proteome, added irrelevant features, which was the protein sequence version. And I, I was just wondering what makes that, in, in your opinion, a good negative control and, and how is that important and how can you evaluate that it does what it's supposed to do? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and thanks for your question. 
uh, in relation to the features that were irrelevant, the question is if, uh, I guess the question is why did I even start with those features to begin with, in a sense? The yeah, why, why are they the there and what are they supposed to do? And how, yeah. do, you, and how do you validate, validate that? Unfortunately, the answer is not as interesting, is that uh, I started by including all data that I, that I could. So if you go to Uniprot, for example, you can download all the information for all proteins. And unfortunately, that also means include uh, features that actually are pretty relevant, such as the version of the protein and the annotation of the protein, obviously but also even things like organism, right? If I am studying on the human, then all will be human, and therefore there's not okay. that much information. Uh, yeah, I un uh, okay, I understand that these irrelevant data are in the database, but they, mm -hmm. you don't mention them specifically to, do, to have them as a sort of a, 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 a negative control or something like that. No, no, I mean, even... Okay, no, then, then it's okay, ah, because okay. I just didn't understand why you emphasize that you have irrelevant data in there. Oh, okay. Um, and furthermore, you describe features for the microRNA expression mm -hmm. and for the circular RNA expression, the CERC. Uh, and then you select only those with more than seven uh, targeting sites. And then here you also add the sponge effect. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, but you don't explain how that sponge effect is actually determined. I was wondering if it also relates to this number of targeting sites. Yeah. So as in how did I evaluate how many target sites were possible? Yeah, not necessarily mostly that, but how you uh, determine the sponge effect. Yeah, so what I determined by that was uh, specifically looking at how many targets were possible in a circular RNA. I saw that in most cases, if you just check the accordance between the microRNAs and potential sequences, because microRNAs are very small, that it basically yeah. means a lot of potential interactions. So to filter that, I checked the, basically the distribution of how many did occur, which mo was more of a, a negative binomial distribution. And then what I did was basically evaluate at which point in that distribution there's actually an acceleration in the number of seeds. On, so number of seeds, I mean the number of sick, uh, RNA sequences that can bind a microRNA, but not any microRNA, but a specific microRNA. In this terms of circular RNA, when, let's say historically, when it started with all this talk about RNA, circular RNA as a sponge of microRNAs, it started because they found a circular RNA that was actually able to bind several of them. And they said, okay, this might actually have a real effect because it's not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but a seven to one, for example. So. I wanted to incorporate that as an actual as the actual effect of the circular RNAs and not just a one on one. So that's why I selected, okay, starting at this amount of seeds, I will consider a circular RNA as it's actually doing this sponge effect as a feature of the Okay, model. so these two are clearly related. Yes. And that's what you uh, uh, how you identified the sponge effect in the uh, parameter. How many microns okay. combined? And then if you go to figure number four, um, you show a ranking of features. Uh, but May I get that page again, sir? Uh, figure number four, which in is page? on page 128. 128. Um, and I was wondering what you actually have on the x-axis, because uh, in figure number six, you have a comparable uh, thing that I can relate to that. You have a maximum number of 100. So I was wondering how to interpret that, or is that just a relative ranking? It is a relative ranking in the sense of that uh, the, what the specific package that I use to evaluate these values, what it does is takes any value and then it ranks it between 100 and zero. So in that case, for example, as, as you said, in number four, the maximum is 100, but neither of them come to there. But then we, when we go to cardiac, there is actually one of them that reaches that maximum yeah, that, that's why I was wondering what the, if that actually means something like that. It's I, actually the question raised rather from figure six, uh, right. six than from ten. Right. So it's normalized. So it knows how much because every algorithm mm -hmm. has different uh, values for that. So what, normally what we do is you normalize to to at least the maximum being a hundred, or in yeah. some cases oh, okay. yeah. even not that. I understand that now. So yeah. does it also imply that based on this figure four you can? Uh, actually say something, conclude something about the added value of having these circular RNAs and microRNAs in, in the analysis. Indeed, yes. So that's why one, one of the reasons why I added that, because um, basically 
how did I get to this 10? Why 10 and no more or less? So what I did was uh, an algorithm which is called recursive feature elimination, in which what you do is you take the model with all features that you can evaluate, and then it, you rank it using all the features. And then you remove the one that is least important. And then you do that continuously yeah, yeah, in a loop. Yeah. And then what I found was that having 10 features, more or the model had the same uh, accuracy as it had all of them. Sometimes actually having more features is detrimental to the model. So that's why I selected 10, because that was actually the po optimal point between number of features and performance. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Uh, so if we then go to figure number six, uh, yeah. which is then based on the training with the cardiac data set, you only find seven out of 10 features. Um, and in your discussion on page 133, you state right. as expected the most important ones are now related to uh, mRNA expression. Yeah. Now, I found that very confusing because uh, you ac actually aim to explain the gap between mRNA and the proteome. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't there so much to gain in yeah. the first place. So this, this statement actually makes you doubt your own yeah. starting point. You mean as what is the added value if we already knew that from the beginning? Yeah, I would never right. write if I had to defend my thesis as expected. This uh, <laughs> leads to nothing. Basically, that's how I read this. Or do no. I read it wrong? Indeed. No. So what I mean is that even though uh, the molecular biology behind it, we already know that the most important character for the relationship between transcriptomics and proteomics is the message RNA, because that's the origin of what is actually produced. Uh, by building the model, I did not expect actually what would come up first. Yeah, that's okay. And so that, you, you do listen to what you say. I, I didn't expect anything, but you, no, you, no. So you, wrote, you expect this to happen. I, I expect this can happen, yeah. but knowing, but, but because I let the model evaluate everything, mm. you still don't know exactly what's going to happen. If you're mo mm, there are sometimes models, unfortunately, as it was mentioned before, that because mach machine learning models are not explainable, Sometimes you get features that on, on first sight don't actually make sense and, and actually get, uh, are more important than other stuff. So what I okay. meant was that the transcriptomics features that we are already evaluating, we let the model decide, okay, is this also relevant or not? Even in yeah. case of uh, microRNAs as well. Yeah. Because some people... So, so, okay, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Do I still have time for one last question? Only if it's a very, very short one. No, yeah, I think a, we should go to the next one. It's a very crucial one. Uh, so um, you indicate, you also even had that in your presentation, that random forest is the best performing one. But if I look at figure three, yeah. I conclude that random forest, canaries, neighbors, and cubists perform equally well. And so my question is, uh, do you think this is completely data set independent, or could it, if you just had a slightly different data set, have one of the others being as, as good, uh, because they are all around 70% uh, in this, uh, in this mm. case. Correct. That is uh, an, an interesting question, because obviously when I validated the, the model, I already selected random forest for cardiac. So yeah. what I can tell is that from what I remember, random forest, even when I use cardiac data set, it was still one of the one of them at least in the top three in top performance. Okay, but uh, that was actually my next question. Why okay. didn't you check <laughs> in the cardiac set? Because you could check that. So that yeah. is actually what you found as well. But also there in the cardiac set, uh, you have uh, you have comparable performances uh, yet again with other uh, algorithms. I think the the, the yeah. point is clear. So uh, yeah. short answer, please. Yeah. So I I. Again, unfortunately, one of my weaknesses is memory, but I would ex at least, for me, what it's reconforting or at least helps to validate is that using the same algorithm, which might have been in the, uh, specific for the liver data, actually performed a similar result to cardiac data. Now, could I have found a better algorithm? Maybe, mm. but it was more about validating more than actually testing new algorithms. Uh, and it would have been comparable. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor De Kock. I now turn to a guest from abroad, but not so far away, because as we all can see, Dr. Sikander Hayat is a group leader in bioinformatics in the Uniclinic of the RWTH in Aachen. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, dear candidate, a really nice um, um, thesis and tackling a very important question uh, 
dealing both with computation and biology. So I'll start with the last chapter, uh, continuing from the, the analogy of weather prediction. So um, you talk about classification problem here. Mm -hmm. You are saying, okay, it's gonna be a good day or a bad day, it's gonna be rainy or sunny. What if we had to find out how much will it rain or how dry will it be? How would you convert your model to make it more predicting continuous values? Hmm. Um, related to that, um, there is a time component in the data set that you had. You have uh, 21 samples, you have three models there where you take everything, then uh, certain time intervals and certain time intervals. Mm -hmm. So my question there is, or maybe I misunderstood this, the manual annotation of the genes that are relevant or irrelevant or dubious, mm -hmm. do they change over time? So it could be important for me at time point two, might not be relevant for me at a later time point. How would you deal with these kind of time series changes? Thanks. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. That is indeed one of the relevant questions, funnily enough, uh, about this model, because the problem is that you have time data in a model that you're not actually using to evaluate these time effects. Now, obviously, I use the time data set not so much to actually evaluate these time points, but actually to uh, use them as an increased number of observations to compare across them. So the question is to evaluate these time differences it would actually require to be able to somehow configure or categorize this model, right? Because how can you actually be able to tell a model? So in a, in a way that would actually be necessary to be done in the manual annotation itself. So somehow be able to realize, okay, if I only need, uh, let's say from eight hours forward and I don't care about the first ones, somehow you has, have to uh, fit that into the model and to fit that into a model you have to annotate it yourself so at least in a way obviously there would be maybe more automated ways of doing that you could still use statistics just to check okay independently of the difference between the first time points and the rest remove all the ones that don't have that for example right but in the end that's one of let's say virtues and defects defects of machine learning is that it will also do what you're training the model to do. So if, if the, and as also was mentioned, trash in, trash out. If you don't actually manually input into the model what you actually want, then you won't actually get it. So I guess, uh, to be concrete, uh, for that scenario, you would actually need to change the model to fit the desired goal. So to take into account those time point differences. Sounds good, thank you. I mean, um, in general, in the whole thesis, you are uh, touching upon a lot of topics related to supervised learning. So maybe right. in some cases, unsupervised learning could maybe also be uh, um, a, a solution. Right. So um, moving forward with um, uh, another interesting thing that you discussed was interpretability. Right. Right. Um, then there is uh, another thing uh, that we have to consider with these machine learning models. So let's say if a person from another lab wants to use it. And mm -hmm. that person is maybe not a, a computational scientist, right. um, but someone who can do programming. Did you try the deployment of your machine learning models? Uh, how, uh, how would a person deploy these things? Right. How difficult is it to deploy? How expensive it is in terms of computational uh, difficulty? Like, can you make a website that people can use? Mm -hmm. Or do you need to uh, have like a high performance computing system to run these systems? Right. How expensive they are? Mm -hmm. So there are two, two answers to that question because I had two models. So for the first one, it was more of an approach to showcase that if you have enough data, in, in, in my case, right, the different omics, so small RNA sequencing and RNA sequencing ribodepleted so that you can also get the circular RNAs, you should be able to replicate what I got both in liver and in heart. But because it was more to showcase that that was possible, it was not so much about getting, giving you a model. Because what I was able to show in that chapter was that if you build a model taking these features into account using your own data, you will be able to predict better or to impute the proteomics values. But I was not giving, let's say, the model per se, but just how you have to configure it. So for that, you definitely need the programming skills to be able to build the model. I mean, definitely there, should, there, could, and there is a way to just give a program the data that you have 
and then I could have the programming to integrate that data and deliver what you want. But that was not the point and was not done. While for the fifth chapter, actually I did that. So for AutoRail, what I did, uh, obviously as, as you have read in the fifth chapter, I checked, right, which were how many replicates uh, and how many, and every, right, every accumulation of data generated different results. And I re realized that the one with the most uh, different results was the one that did the better, which sometimes is what you expect in machine learning. How many, uh, uh, the more variable the data you input, the better train the model is. And so that model is the one that I actually saved as a package in GitHub. And in, I, confer, I convert it in a way so that the only thing that you have to do is that, well, you only, for some people, not, but uh, you have to run the DSEC2 pipeline as always. Mm -hmm. And then you input the results, so both the uh, normalized reads of the counts plus the results in terms of statistics. If you fit that into the model, which is already read in the Redmi document, it will give you the three different classes. Sounds great. One final question. Actually, I'd also like the last opponent to have uh, an opportunity. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I now turn to Dr. Lars Eisen, and he is an assistant professor in bioinformatics of our university. Thank you very much. Dear candidate, um, I was also impressed by the work because you indeed took uh, the challenge, as Professor de Kock already said, you know, to, to, to dive in very complicated things, both from biology, you know, on the edge of our understanding and also from the machine learning parts and try to combine this all. So this is uh, a challenge you took. Uh, actually, I think um, one of the questions uh, uh, Dr. Hayat wanted to focus on. Uh, I actually also have my list, so we will still cover the topic. And this is on chapter three, where you, where you introduce a model. You know, I was happy to see some formula in a thesis. That makes me happy. But I, uh, I also look at it carefully. And then I thought, okay, there is a few things we can ask. And let's start with one thing that was on both our lists, and that is uh, you, you have some fixed values in there, some coefficients. Right. And uh, we were wondering a bit, so uh, yeah, how did you get, you know, how did you set them? Right. Um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Um, I guess especially you mean the one related to Micronic coefficient, which that was 0.1? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so first, there were two reasons why I set that number in that way. First is because I tested the data set with values between zero and one to basically check, okay, obviously a microRNA cannot bind more than one transcript at the same time, so it cannot be above one. And in the worst case scenario, it doesn't have any effect, so zero. So, and then we wanted to evaluate, okay, um, how, how many microRNAs are actually able to, to bind to this, right? Because the, actually the proportion is different. So I did the, let's say, more in a sense, maybe bioinformatics point and biological point. So the bioinformatics one was that I actually checked all values between zero and one and checked the one that got me the best results. And that was around 0 0.1. And the other reason why I took that one was because in ComboSec, normally you see that in ComboSec, you actually are able to sequence both the transcripts as in messenger RNAs, but also microRNAs simultaneously. And what is found normally is that around 10% of the reads come from microRNAs. So around all the reads or all RNAs that you are able to capture, around 10% tend to be the ones for microRNA. So using those both arguments is the reason why I, I specified that specific value. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, especially because in our case, we were using a small RNA sequencing and RNA sequencing. And we were putting them together, the values together. So I expected that the, it was not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Because obviously, when you normalize, it takes different values, right? So to yeah. correct for that, I, that's why I selected that coefficient, and that's how I selected that specific number. OK, thank you for this uh, clarification. Uh, to continue on the model, of course, it's a model, and the model is always you know, a, a representation of the truth, but right. not the full truth. I still wanted to reflect with you a bit on what is in the model and what is not. So you take yeah, the sponging effects and so on into account. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the real cell, right, with all the stuff in it, uh, ca can you elaborate a bit on maybe what other you know, uh, more, maybe more complicated dynamics of the whole thing are not so much captured in the model then? 
And did you, we were still talking about chapter three? Yes. Right. So there are some uh, ideas and data that was ac actually able to then implement in the next chapter. So one of them is, for example, Half-Life. Half-Life is actually very crucial to uh, be able to evaluate these things. And there are two uh, easy examples to check that. So for example, if the increase in the RNA level is very rapid, then, may then maybe when you sequence, you don't actually see that, but you do actually see the difference in proteomics. So that's why the half-life of the transcript is important. And for the half-life of proteins, it's also important because even if, for example, the RNA level decreases, because the half-life is so long, you won't actually be able to see the change until f into the future, right? So this is, for example, one of the things that I wasn't, I did not incorporate into the formula. Um, so yeah, that is, for example, one. Also, you could take into account um, also the weather def because okay, you can m more or less evaluate how many proteins there are, but actually, without we're, you're not actually normally interested on in just the amount of proteins, but actually whether these proteins are active. So nom sometimes that needs some modifications like phosphorylation. And we also did not have that, also because our proteins, proteomics data did not include it. So yeah, there are different things, right? You could also, if you want to even include it, uh, epigenetics, so you could actually also uh, see in the future whether the effect of the transcriptomics is just a temporary thing that you're seeing or something that will be constant. So indeed, there are still so many things that, uh, specifically for that formula, the servers are, were already struggling with this level of complexity. So yeah. with our materials, we couldn't have gone much further, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, clear. Um, so uh, I'm also looking at time, so there are many questions to ask, but I, I, I stick with this chapter then. Uh, and I, I, I still want to ask about, but also reflects a bit on chapter two. So mm -hmm. you, yeah, yeah, you look at the results and it's big, data but many you know all these players in there and you look for uh, things where the models improve or things where some pattern is found right but we also have many many observations we make right. you know we do lots of testing so i and i see a, a, a little of evaluation of you know is this more than chance what we find because mm. i believe you that you say yeah for this one protein and this you know mrna it worked Right. Yeah, yeah, likely. But uh, can you can you say something about mm -hmm. you know how how much better is it than what you would find by chance given right. all the molecules? You mean the in chapter two, right? When we evaluate the levels, it's of in chapters RNAs. two and three. You pick out examples where it worked, right? right? You say it doesn't always, but can you can you quantify a bit, like you know? Hmm. So in chapter two, the good thing is obviously we were we have some validation done in different conditions, different cells, different origins, and we still got the same results. As was mentioned, there's still it's an N of two. But yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. when you change so many things and still it works, okay, it, it at least decreases the probability that it's just a fluke, but still not uh, robust enough, unfortunately. And for so that's what I did. Also, because for Circidil, the relation between that specific circuit microRNA and uh, protein, let's say, up to the end, was actually something that was also found in other studies which I did actually not know. It was just when I searched for that specific relationship between the three that I found in my own data, I was able to find it also in a Wilms tumor, which, uh, which actually was one paper was just focused on that one. And by me, by actually checking some toxicology data, I found the same, right? So that in a sense is just, could it be chance that you find the exact same relationship between three very different models uh, I mean, three different molecules mm. using th different technologies and still you find the same. That's okay. You can still increase the end as always. But I would say in a way, at least for what we had, the materials and time was good enough for us. And for chapter three, that is indeed uh, a difficult situation because indeed we have the proteomics data, which is in, in our case was the best that we could do to validate. Now, if mm. you want to validate further, you can actually check that, right? You can do Western blot and be able to validate the changes. But unfortunately, that was the maximum that we could do. And actually, this is also the maximum answer that you will get. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your question, uh, Dr. Le Juan Osciotteco. So the time for the defense of your thesis has now really passed. Um, uh, the committee here will withdraw 
and discuss the quality of the thesis and the defense you just gave. And I would ask you and your company here to await the results of our deliberations, uh, and thereby I adjourn. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time around but you get to use to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
que diguéssim que no. Que diguéssim que no. And then, Juan Ochoteco Asensio. The, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of the thesis and of the defense you just did. In view of its positive verdict, and taking in, into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And therefore, Professor Klein Jans, your promoter, is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University custom. So, Please, supervisor, take the floor. First of all, let me ask you a critical question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. That's the correct answer, so we can proceed. <coughs> By the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Juan Ochoteco Asensio, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear doctor, dear Juan, I am very pleased to be the first one to be able to congratulate you with the, with the uh, result obtained after in, in these four years and particularly today. I was much surprised by your defense. So thank you. But of course, uh, the, the real Wadasio will be uh, read by your supervisor, Florian Kemal. Dear Juan, or should I say, dear doctor Ochoteco, I sent you now. Uh, congratulations, I'm the second one then to be able to congratulate you. I think you did very well. Uh, and so uh, you know, I want to uh, congratulate you again for that. So building your Laudatio was actually kind of difficult, not for a lack of content, but, but more for the opposite. Uh, like you, if we can say one thing about you is that you are some type of anecdote generator and we all have a lot of story around uh, involving you. And so I have to limit myself uh, to a, a short uh, speech here, but I have plenty of anecdotes and people who want to learn more, you know, they are welcome to discuss with me at the receptions. Uh, I have a lot of funny story involving one. So let's start with the beginning. So, so your thesis uh, started with uh, actually Professor Jörg Sklenjens, uh, having coordinated ECATOS, an EU project that ended four years ago. There was a pile of data remaining. And so you suggested that he could uh, create two new PhD students to work on the, on the legacy of those, of those uh, data. And so, you know, to avoid having direct competition between those two students, student, I propose to yours that maybe we could have one a bit further away from toxicology, a bit more on the computer science, machine learning, multi-omics type of things. Yours agreed, so we, we went into interviewing candidates, and so we met you from Barcelona uh, with exactly the type of profile we, we were looking for. And so um, a computer science uh, master uh, able to understand biology. It's so exactly what we wanted. And, and we also had this nice uh, um, um, behavior that you have, this nice character that you have. So we find someone very motivated, very dynamic, very enthusiastic, uh, which is not necessarily the particular skills of, of computer scientists. You know, when, you do, when you depict computer scientists, you don't see someone very social. You imagine someone 
behind a laptop, not talking to any humans, you know, like you want a bit like me. Uh, <laughs> but so you, you, you were, are really not like that. And, and so when we ask you, um, when can you start? You said the typical answer, I can start tomorrow. Except that in your case, that was kind of true. So maybe not the next day, but maybe the next Monday, you were already in, in the university looking for meeting people, discussing with people, and so on. <coughs> so um, you, you have this particular character, as I say, very dynamic. And, and I, I think it comes from you being the son of a very, uh, the oldest son of a very big family. So you have a lot of siblings. I have to say, I'm, I'm not sure how many nowadays. <laughs> you have a lot. It seems to fluctuate. Or I don't know. It's complicated. But at least seven, I, I guess. So um, you, you, and then you were raised in this, I would imagine, very lively environment. And so this quality of being very motivated and enthusiastic uh, became at the beginning an issue, actually, with your roommate. So uh, as supervisor or the PhD student in your room, uh, I, I was initially contacted by some of my own other PhDs, you know, who told me, one is great, everyone loves him, you know, but he talks all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> we, we have seen that a bit today, you can talk. Uh, so, uh, and, and, then, and then that was a bit annoying, apparently, and you had this booming voice and booming, booming laugh. And, and that's, so I remember that we discussed that with yours, and we said, like, this is not a problem to fix, they are grown up, they, they, can, they can deal with that, with their own problems. So we have seen the, the noise concerning headphone in your room <laughs> increasing drastically. Uh, but so, so, you know, that, that was okay, um, up to the point that uh, at the beginning, uh, I was not necessarily, you know, I was a bit under impressed, let's say, by the speed to which you were able to, you know, the, the progress every week, you know. So I, I, I had this, this feeling that maybe indeed efficiency could be better. And so I remember we discussed again that uh, with yours, and we took the decisions to isolate you for your own good and for the good of your roommates, so we put you alone in an office to see if this, this would improve. And actually, we could not test that for a long time because, and that's another particular feature of you and that I may mention now, is that you are also a religious man. And so church has an important part in your life, which is also not typically for a scientist, but. And so, you know, I, I'm not a religious man, but if I make an hypothesis of being a religious man, so maybe a higher power than Yos and I decided that isolation should be for you and for everyone. <laughs> and then we had this COVID <laughs> lockdown, which obviously struck, and then for sure you were alone working on, <laughs> on, on your things. Which I anticipated as myself, the typical computer scientist, you know, for me, lockdown is just another day behind my laptop. <laughs> So I, it doesn't change that much, but I, I, I did not anticipate it that for you that was kind of difficult, uh, especially being alone uh, in your room, far from your family, not being able to go to, to Spain. That was difficult, and I, I want to apologize for not being able to have catch up that, you know, and that was a, a difficult time. But so at the end of this first wave, uh, actually, we had this wake-up meeting that I'm sure you remember, where we decided, like, you know, I, I was concerned that we, we would not have enough to make a, 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 te a thesis at the end. And so we really had to change something. Another thing that happened during this lockdown is that we lost Yost, who retired for real, during this period and di disappeared from the, from, the, from the theme, I would say. And so the problem that we have, I think, is that we are too similar. We discussed that a lot. So we are those chaotic, creative scientists who can you know, generate ideas, we are not limited with bench fee because we are bioinformaticians. We can program whatever we think of. And that's the problem at some point is that you know, I've learned from yours myself that you don't make a thesis out of ideas. You make theses out of papers and you have to write them at some point. And so I, I, I needed to learn myself to become a better supervisor to structure the work. And I have to say that from this day, you know, you change completely. Uh, and, and the people I discussed to uh, who knew you from the start and now, I, I've seen a huge evolution. Uh, and, and actually, that was also noticed by yours, uh, that you are completely now, you, you've grown up a lot during those four years. And so you were able to meet all the deadlines, the, you know, and, and that was actually, uh, you did a very, you know, the second half of your thesis was extremely, uh, maybe we worked too, too, too much, basically. <laughs> That's another problem. Okay, so uh, for your future now, you are looking for a, a postdoc, and I, you were offered actually a very valuable uh, uh, hardcore position in Texas. 
to which finally you decided that you, you would prefer to stay around your, your family, and I guess that that's, you know, uh, so coming from your story, I, I think that, that may be a smarter decision. But anyway, you want to make a postdoc in academia, uh, and so I, I wish you the best uh, for your future and to follow up on the tradition, which I set up and I deeply regret that, but I have to do it. So I have finished with a, a few words in your own tongue uh, by saying, so, uh, uh, estimado doctor uh, Ochoteco uh, Asensio, uh, felic felicitades uh, para esta tesis, oh, sorry, I, I say it again. Estimado doctor Ochoteco Asensio, Felicitades por esta defensa de tesis y mis mayores deseos para su futuro. Okay. Thank you. Dear Dr. Oshateko, let me then be the third person to congratulate you. Thank you. Um, uh, that also extends, of course, to the family. I mean, you've been raising this beautiful young doctor and, um, and he now got to this point of success. And of course, the supervisor team, doc, uh, Professor Jos Kleinjans and Dr. Florian Clément. Uh, um, I always uh, say some personal things. Uh, referring back to the um, introduction, to, to the summary, and you introduced chapter five, I think, by uh, having this Spanish giant <laughs> You're well on the way. <laughs> Not physically, maybe, but uh, scientifically. I think uh, everybody was impressed by the way, uh, uh, well, by the clarity of your thesis, the work that you uh, reported there, but especially also about the defense. And, and you know, I, I witnessed very many defenses, actually, and seemingly relaxed. You knew how to answer the questions and really answer the questions, mostly... Uh, candidates sort of evade, evade the, the difficult points, and, uh, and you, but you were really uh, to the point. And as, some, uh, as one of the opponents said, you, you are really on top of the, the things that you've done. So, um, and that makes it uh, really easy, uh, of course, to, uh, to be here and relax yourself. Mm. I was a bit amazed, I must say, about proposition number 10. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training, and um, uh, this does not really show too much self-respect. <laughs> um, I hope that now you do still uh, agree that uh, even people who obtained their PhDs are, are very special and, uh, and have a good future. <laughs> um, thanks to all the opponents, of course, especially the one who came from afar, although not so afar, <laughs> but we are always very pleased when there's somebody from another university coming and witnessing our ceremonies because it attests, of course, to the importance of, the, of these events. I wish you all the best for the future. Also with Melanie, um, I think uh, it was a beautiful sentence, the last word in your, in your, um, um, uh, in your thanks uh, within the thesis. Now, I think uh, we should all go and have some fun in uh, what we call the Refter, because it used to be a monastery. Uh, that's where the reception area is. Um, before you go out, we go out, we go to the stairs, I think, in the, in the hall, and somebody can take a photograph as a, you know, as a memory to this uh, beautiful occasion. Uh, and then, meanwhile, you can all proceed to the Refter, and we will join you there. Uh, and thereby, I'd like to close this session.